Hey church, it's been said the 4th of July is the day many Americans celebrate their freedom by sitting trapped in traffic jams for hours seeking that ultimate fireworks display. <laughs> Ouch! Well, somewhere around the road of life, I suspect most of us have had that shared experience. I hope your memory of this 4th will be better than that. I've got so many good memories as a kid on the 4th of July. We were raised as city boys during the week, but as country boys on most weekends, because most weekends, we visited my grandfather's farm in rural South Dakota. Now, when it came to the 4th, the city rules were no fireworks, but the country rules were let her rip. <laughs> but so you can guess where my brother and I hung out on the 4th. It was with a grandfather who knew all those finer points of bottle rockets and firecrackers and Roman candles. I have many great memories from the 4th, and I hope you make your own wonderful and safe memories during this holiday. Happy 4th of July, everyone. May we all come together as one this weekend and celebrate our nation, our freedom, and our God in peace. You know, when you think about it, Independence Day is this celebration of our shared freedom from something that we found oppressive. Wow, I mean, that's a holiday that'll preach this year. After a long pandemic, freedom from oppression resonates much deeper in every one of our souls this year. Here's my shared hope. May we all find rest during this holiday from whatever weariness that's been weighing down our souls. For this is a day to relax, to reflect, and to regain a healthy perspective of what's most important in our lives. I'm glad worshiping God is at the top of that list for you. Thank you for participating in this online act of worship that also coincides with our nation's 4th of July celebration. Would you pray with me? Lord, we ask for your spirit of truth and wisdom and grace and mercy to come and be with us. Be with us individually, be with our families, be with our country, be with our world. Let our country become all that you created it to be, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. I'm bouncing around the Bible a little across these three weeks, lifting up some of my favorite scriptures before we settle into our next sermon series, which begins on July 18th. Last week, we encountered Jesus in John 15, where we, asked, we were asked to be a fruit-bearing branch, abiding in the vining of Christ. Today, we hear Jesus speak from the Gospel of Matthew, beginning at Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus says, Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of God for the people of God, and let us all respond by saying, thanks be to God. Well, what does the 4th of July mean to you? What is the essence of this holiday that we hold so dear? I was pondering that this week, and to understand how I personally answer that question requires me to share a memory from a Burgess family summer vacation from a few years back. We found a small lake. You knew there'd be water involved, right? It had a little sand beach where a handful of families had gathered to build sand castles, swim in the crystal clear water, and bask in the warmth of the summer sun. Absolutely perfect, right? Well, it sounds peaceful enough, but all that changed in an instant when the shouting began. It began in the parking lot about 50 feet away from the water's edge. A large man was shouting abusively at a woman, and she was cringing in fear. His very actions were of a man who'd lost his couth. Now, I don't exactly know what a couth is, but I know he no longer had his. He shouted unspeakable things at this terrified woman, and in his rage, as his rage would ramp up, he began to threaten her in more ways than one. It was ugly. In that moment, people all around them began to step towards them. And one elderly gentleman, a smaller, calmer, seemingly much weaker man, 
popped out his cell phone and walked directly between the angry man and the frightened woman, obviously with hopes that the video of the whole ugly thing would cause the angry man to just walk away in shame. Instead, the Kuthless man got more enraged and he turned all of his fury towards the smaller elderly man. That's when all the others in the parking lot turned on him and you could tell it was both with guarded concern and a willingness to do whatever was necessary. Finally, outnumbered by many calmer minds, the angry man jumped into his car and squealed indignantly out of the parking lot, barely missing people and cars as he left in a heated roar. You know, that scene reminded me about something that lies deep in our American spirit. We just don't like bullies. It doesn't matter the details of the story, we just don't like it when the powerful impose their will over those less powerful. Matter of fact, you could claim that very disdain is the very ideal that initially formed our country. The heritage that we celebrate this weekend comes from a group of bullied people who chose to stand together against an oppressive, powerful government in a confrontation that should have ended badly for the huge underdogs. It, it was a David and Goliath confrontation that initiated our nation. Many inspiring words rang out during all the shouting, words like these. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men, and I'll make it all people today, are created equal, that we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Or these words, we must hang together or we will most assuredly hang separately. <laughs> the truth is, our human spirit simply does not like it when the strong try to impose their will over the weak just because they can. We have a long history of coming together to stand up against bullies in our story. It's a story that goes further back than just the birth of our nation. You know, when Jesus came, he discovered a bully had risen up among the children of God. Now, you might not inherently think of what I'm about to say in that way, but I hope Jesus would agree with me. Let me explain. The bully I'm referring to is the expression of religion as defined by the religious leaders of that day. Now, you might not think of the Pharisees and the scribes as bullies, especially when you remember the Roman soldiers were present too, and they were the ones with the pointy spears and the sharp swords. But I find it interesting that Jesus' ministry was more at odds with the religious leaders than with the Romans. It begs the question, who was the real bully and why? You know, from my read of scriptures, I'd argue that it was humanity's misuse of God's law that was the greater bully when Jesus appeared in the flesh. Faith had become a list of do's and don'ts, with the oppressive list of don'ts becoming very complicated, very burdensome, very heavy. Not only were there the over 600 rules of written Torah law, but to that add the oral law tradition that had expounded on those rules. God's word had been made complex and legalistic and, well, oppressive. We often think Jesus was the only one teaching disciples 2,000 years ago, but that was just not the case. You see, it was common for a teacher to gather students and teach their unique understanding of the Jewish religious law. Teachers who seemed to have it all figured out, well, they tended to draw the greater number of students. And their specific understanding of the law, their teaching was called their yoke. Students were asked to take up the teacher's yoke as they learned from their master. It wasn't uncommon for those traveling teachers and their followers to walk from village to village, teaching their interpretation of the Jewish law to people. And as the generations passed, you can understand how the teaching became more and more convoluted. Well, if you can't do this, then it makes sense that you can't do that and that and that either, until one day the very thing that was supposed to bring connection to God, the law itself, had become a weapon wielded by men who seemingly lost touch with the original intention of God. The yokes became burdensome, heavy, complicated. And the educated men wielding them became the bully, imposing their wills over the people of God. And into that setting, Jesus appears in the flesh. 
Now, if you read Matthew chapters 11 and 12 closely, it appears to be an interaction between Jesus and the people who did not get the teaching he was bringing. You see, his teaching wasn't what people expected from the Messiah. Even John the baptizer in chapter 11 sends his disciples to Jesus to ask him a question. Do you remember the question? Are you the one, Jesus, or do we wait for another? <laughs> I don't know what you hear in that question, but I hear a human being asking Jesus, Are you it? Because we're dying here, and we need to really, really know, are you the one, or are we waiting for the real one yet to come? Here's the astonishing thing. That question was being asked by the pastor who officiated at Christ's baptism. <laughs> that question was being asked by the very guy who said, you know what, I'm not worthy to untie your sandals and you want me to baptize you? That question was being asked by the man who stood dripping wet next to Jesus when the heavens parted and the spirit like a dove descended and God Almighty said, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. So, why was John the baptizer asking that question now? Well, for starters, in chapter 11, John's now in prison. Things aren't going the way I suspect he thought they would go when Jesus showed up. And the truth is, every one of us has shared that same experience of asking a similar sort of question at some point in our lives. You know, like when the unexplainable tragedies of life come. Why do buildings full of people just fall down during the night? Why does a virus change the face of the planet as we know it? Why isn't my beloved still here with me? It isn't supposed to go this way. You know, in those dark times, aren't we the ones often sitting trapped in a prison of sorts, asking, are you really God, Jesus? Well, if you've ever done that, or if you're doing that right now, hear these inspiring words spoken by the Son of God who came to reveal God's heart to us, Jesus says to us all, Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus' yoke, Jesus' teaching, is the one based on love. Love of God and love of each other. In that is the full intent of God's law, said Jesus. When you get that, everything else, gently, simply, wonderfully falls into place. That's the power of the yoke of Jesus Christ. The brokenness of this world can certainly be oppressive at times. I find it truly freeing that God showed up one day teaching us, revealing to us, sharing with us the most powerful force on heaven and earth life-giving, forgiving, redeeming love. That's divinity on earth. We've been given it, and we're being asked to give it to others. So here's the question I want to leave you with today. As you have time to think about it across this holiday, to what are you yoked? I mean, it's a choice we all make. Is it your career? or maybe your own intelligence, or your perceived success, or your finances, or your position of influence in the world, or your sense of comfort, or your stuff, or perhaps even 
yourself. Think about it. What have you chosen to yoke up to? Christians should strive to be yoked to Christ. But I must admit, I'm still struggling to completely figure out what that means. And I, I really hope you don't think less of me when I stand before you today and freely admit that I don't yet understand the entire depth of God's love. It seems to me every time I think I know, I discover I've only begun to scratch the surface of God's love. It's bigger than we think, or perhaps it's even bigger than we can possibly comprehend. All I know is, thank God, it's bigger than us. So maybe like me, you might spend part of this unique holiday that has something to do with gaining the freedom we've been given by our Creator, rethinking what it means to be yoked to Christ, and discerning who the real bully is in our life. Otherwise, you might just get trapped in traffic and miss the fireworks completely when they come. And where's the joy in that? <laughs> Appreciate your God-given freedom. It was paid for at great price. And may all who are weary find rest for their souls as we celebrate our nation, our freedom, and our God. Yoked forever to love of God in love of each other, may we all find rest for our weary souls in Jesus. It seems to me that's what matters most. Amen.